Welcome everyone to our third session of our second Career Edge webinar series created by your Business School Alumni Network. Through this four-part series, we're hoping to provide you with information on being successful in your career, while also helping you brush up on your professional skill set. Thank you for joining us. We have a great session today focused on negotiating your salary. Before we start with uh, some instructions, I want to let you know that we will be taking questions, so please utilize the Q&A function on your screens to submit any questions. And we will get to as many of those as possible during our Q&A at the end of our discussion. Additionally, we will send all attendees a link to a recording of this presentation, any resources we refer to. Um, as far as introductions go, um, my name is Stephanie Filali Mote, an alum of the HR and Business Management program here at the Business School and currently an HR journalist with GNA Partners. Today I will be moderating this session with our presenter, Sue Wyman. Sue Wyman has 15 years of experience in national executive search and over 10 years of experience in career and job search coaching. Prior to launching her search practice, she worked in sales leadership roles in startup and Fortune 50 organizations and led teams of up to 75. Sue has an executive MBA from the University of Denver and a Bachelor of Science in Technical Management from Regis University. Welcome, Sue, and thanks for being here today. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, we'll get right into the, the meat of this. And I think just to start, compensation negotiation can happen in different situations. Um, it can happen at your current company and in your same role. And the times that um, that could happen at, you know, what we know the, the most is um, at your performance review. That's the most typical time for this to happen. But I think it can also be discussed when you've completed a really successful project or if you have kind of an anniversary in the position or in the role. And um, if you've set it up that way, you could request a midterm performance review to discuss things um, a little bit earlier. It can also happen if you're asked to make a lateral move or you receive a promotion. And I think what we think about the most on compensation negotiation is when you're going to a new company and when that happens during the hiring process. So just to give you <clears throat> a few sad facts before we get into it, the average salary increase in the US um, is around 3%. And <clears throat> as you can see, it's been that way for quite some time and really hasn't, um, hasn't increased. Um, promotional increases, it's a better story, but really, in my estimation, not that much better. Mm -hmm. So at management level, the red line, um, you know, you're really not even getting up to a 9% increase. And this is average. Some companies it's better. Um, some companies it's worse. Um, but this is a U.S. average. So, you know, I guess the, the moral of this is, is something that came out in an article in 2014, but I think is as true, if not more true today, that the old model of staying employed at the same company for, for over two years, sometimes over 20 years, is gonna make you earn less over your lifetime by 50% or more. So I think you really have to think about that um, because if you leave, um, you can probably get an increase of 10 to 20 percent. It does give you that opportunity to seek more in, in your salary when you do move to a different position with a different company. Um, whereas staying, the old uh, way of thinking was you stay with a the company, there's that loyalty. So you stay and you just keep getting promoted and get your you know, annual raise. But now it's starting to shift in the thinking around that. Right. And, you know, looking at what inflation is and subtracting inflation from the increases, it's not a glorious, it's not a glorious picture. So 
Um, my motto is you don't stay too long, but yet don't leave too soon. And I think the thing you have to ask yourself, and the reason why you have to ask yourself this is because there is only one person in charge of your career, and that is you. Um, you know, it's not a paternal system where there's a company and they're going to take care of you. Um, that used to exist to a certain degree. I don't think that's existed for a long time. So the questions you have to ask are, can you learn more where you're at? Um, can you earn more? And is there a benefit to staying one more year? Because I've heard this a lot from people of saying, you know, I'm just going to stay one more year and then I'm going to leave. And sometimes that one year turns into five years and 10 years. And, um, you know, maybe it's a good thing, depending on your situation, it could absolutely be. But you have to make that assessment and you should probably make that assessment on, at the very least on an annual basis. And if you're already thinking about, <clears throat> should I stay, should I go, more likely your production and your performance is gonna start lacking as well. And then, you know, it could be year one or year two after you started switching your thinking on that, that you start to see your performance valuations are affected by that as well. And just your mental attitude, mm -hmm. you know, about it. But so um, in compensation negotiation, you have to ask. Um, going back to not being a paternal where you're patted on the back and, and told you're, you know, you're going to get this wonderful increase. Um, men are better at the ass than women. I, no one likes it. No one loves compensation negotiation. But I think women in particular, um, you have to think about this and do it more because men are eight times more likely to ask than women. It's uncomfortable for everybody. Yeah, nobody likes <laughs> it. It's uncomfortable it. for you. It's a, it can be awkward for your boss or whoever you're having the conversation with. It's just awkward all around, but if you don't ask, you'll never know. Right. So how you can make it easier, because I think preparation is important for whatever you're going to do, but in this case, researching salary ranges, and we'll talk about some specifics on how to do that, and having a strategy for how you present your current compensation. This certainly is going to come up a lot during the hiring um, process. And then the strategy for how do you justify that ask? What, you know, what are you going to, to say? And not just asking um, during the hiring process, but even in your employment. Um, I actually have a friend that was moving from Cheyenne, Wyoming to Denver um, as a store manager, a retail store. And we're significantly higher here in Denver than Cheyenne, Wyoming. Um, and he was not going to get a pay increase, you know. Um, and so I had a conversation with him, did all the research and provided him with the salary comparison. And he took that to the owners of the company and he was able to negotiate a $6,000 year increase off of that. If, you, if he hadn't asked, there'd be no $6,000. No. And um, you could kind of say, is, is it going to only cost 6000 more right. in Denver? Maybe not. Exactly. But it's still 6000 they wouldn't have had. Mm -hmm. But employers, everybody's fear around this is, one, it's uncomfortable. But, but two, they're afraid in a hiring process or even in their current situation that people are going to get mad at them. And in the hiring process, um, employers have said, 85% have said, I expect people to ask. And 87% say, say that they've never rescinded an offer. And if you think about those 13% that did, maybe did, you, you know, maybe they were just that way, which means you probably wouldn't want to work there anyway. But beyond that, those 13% could have been real jerks in how they asked and mm -hmm. if they did their homework and the reasonableness and all those sorts of things. So, um, but I think it's that 87% is important that they haven't said, oh, how rude of you. <laughs> I'm taking the offer off the table. Um, okay, now we have a little poll. So um, what we'd like you to do real quickly is just to answer the poll. First question, have you ever negotiated a salary increase? And if so, were you successful? I'll give it just a little bit more time as 
responses come in. Love seeing these responses. Yeah, this is pretty cool. Maybe just one more second, get any final answers in. Great. Okay. Let's see what the results are. So um, there are a lot of yeses, and that's that's pretty cool. And um, some people got exactly what they were asking for. In other cases, it was a compromise. And I'm, I'll probably say this in a later slide, but if you ask for more than what you think you can get, the compromise feels a lot better. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that compromise is going in, in a good that direction. That feels good, yes. <laughs> so um, for your current company, I think what you need to do is you need to define your accomplishment um, for the most relevant time period. So maybe that's six months, maybe it's a year. Um, it depends. You want to go to what's most advantageous for you um, in your role. One way to do this to tell your story, because stories really work, um, there are many different approaches you can use with a lot more lesson, or letters than CAR, but CAR kind of simplifies it in what was the circumstance, what did you do, and how did it turn out? Well, clearly you want to you know, tell a story that has a good result. But having measurable things um, to be able to say will help you in a compensation negotiation process. It will help you in an interview process, mm -hmm. all of those sorts of things. And I would recommend just as certain events happen and um, accomplishments, make note of that. Create your own document that you can kind of keep track of like dates and statistics or information that you can use because not only can you use that when you're negotiating for salary, but you can also add that kind of information to your resume when you're going on to look for a new position. Absolutely. Um, we do a lot of that when we're working with students and alums on resumes. And you really have to think about it. Um, and it's easiest to think about it when you've just accomplished it. Exactly, rather than, than trying to go later. back and remember right. the details. But you know, be aware, be conscious of the timing. Um, you know, there are good times to ask and there are bad times to ask. So certainly like not after the worst quarter your company's ever had or you know, you've just been in the newspaper for all sorts of bad things, not you personally, but the company. Um, but also, you know, the mood of the person that you are going to try and negotiate with. Right. Good days and bad days. So defining your worth, and I think the point of this is really the bullet that says, don't underestimate your value. If you underestimate your value, everyone else will too. And coming into it with really a positive mindset. And um, so, you know, doing the salary research for what your market price should be, being realistic about that, and then defining what your personal personal value is and and that can have many ingredients some of them you know if you've just completed a, a degree um, if you've gone back for a certificate you know if you've done some mm -hmm. things online on Udemy or um, Coursera or some of those things yeah what your professional ex experience is and, and what we talked about before what your accomplishments are and being able to define them, then being able to communicate them either to a hiring manager or your current boss, you know, that can equal um, real earning power. And it's important to be your own advocate. Just because you went and got a new certificate and your company paid for it and you passed, doesn't necessarily mean that they're gonna immediately acknowledge that and, you know, maybe do a bonus or increase based on that. You need to be your own advocate and and bring that to your boss's or supervisor's attention and ask for it. So um, the considerations that you should have, you know, the results of your research, um, you know, like we said before, Cheyenne's different than Denver, which is different than San Francisco. So mm -hmm. think about the location um, component of it. What industry you're in. Some industries pay 
better than other industries and what your specific role is. Some companies, you know, we've graciously used the root frugal, but what we really <laughs> mean is it's cheap. So know if this company you're looking at or this company or this organization you're in um, has that. Um, and, you know, do they negotiate? There, I've talked to employers in Denver that do not negotiate no matter what. Yeah. But I would say that they're in the minority, not in the majority. So if you're changing industries, you know, you may take a little ding because of that. Um, and if you're completely changing roles and you're transitioning, um, you may not be able to get as much money as you had in your previous position. So you really have to be very realistic and about do your due things. diligence as well. Right. Um, you know, are you over underqualified? Are you, and be realistic. You know, in some organizations, I've seen people who are very overpaid. Yeah. And again, that doesn't happen a lot. But if you're really overpaid at that particular company or in that particular industry and you want to switch, you kind of have to know what you're facing and be able to make that decision about do you want to go. So there are all kinds of ways to do salary research. Um, salary.com used to be the best way to do it. Um, but in preparation for this, um, I think salary.com makes it harder every time I go into it and look. It's definitely not the go-to these days there's a lot more um apps and um resources available that are a little easier and right user friendly quick um linkedin if you think about how many what 460 million people are on linkedin um they have a great base of um of um, people in all different areas and in in some of these they will tell you in um in um, LinkedIn and Indeed, I think they both tell you how big the pool is yeah. that they're talking about. And it's a real, LinkedIn salary is very quick and easy to do it. Uh, Indeed's a little bit more complicated of just finding it because it's not the easiest area it's to get right into. right in, in right. front of you. But Glassdoor will go down specifically to your company and um, and positions and, and, and in your company so you can see a range. And of course, on Glassdoor, the bigger the company, the more data there will be in it. Um, really small companies might not have anything because people might not have filled it out. So this is what you would get on LinkedIn salary. So a range from 42 to 105, which is an enormous range. <laughs> so um, if you're at 42, I don't think you're going to be able to negotiate for 105. But no. uh, um, if you're at 42, can you negotiate to 65. You know, that's a question, but you better have a plan. But you can also drill down on the top to specific industries and years of experience. But this one has 872 responses. So that's a pretty decent um, um, size. And it does talk about annual bonus. Um, but what you can tell is this is that annual bonus for the person who's the lucky person who's at 42 or, you know, where that is. But you can get a general um, um, gist of it. Okay, so this is an Indeed example. Um, a little bit smaller pool, but specific to Denver um, in the last three years, which is a fairly long time. But I think you could see from some of the other data, it hasn't changed dramatically. I wish in Denver it changed more quickly. Yeah. Um, but the average on that one's uh, 59, and a much higher range at the, I mean, much lower, much higher. So that 14,000, I don't yeah. even know what that means. So on Glassdoor, um, here's an example at 77,000. Um, has different industries on the side. I mean, this is pretty like this didn't take me any time to pull this up. Um, the thing I didn't like about salary.com is that it wanted you to compare um, operations manager roles. Well, the, the comparison areas were too big for yeah. being an operations manager in IT versus in a warehouse. It just wasn't, you know, uh, apples to apples. So we got 65, we got 59, we got 77. So you've got a, just a general idea of, of where it's at. 
So you know if you're at 30, if you're at 42, you've got some room. Yeah. It gives you something to work with, and it gives you the the resource and the information that you need to be able to go to either the company that you're applying for or your current position and talk to your supervisor and provide that data. Um, having something to back up what you're coming with um, really will help. You know, another thing on compensation, um, you really have to look at the whole picture. And um, we have a comparison sheet um, that helps you do this, particularly if you're, you're interviewing for different jobs, if you're on that side of the equation. Everybody thinks about base, but there are a lot more things than base that you can negotiate. And if you think about that compromise position, um, sometimes maybe you don't get what you want additionally in base, but maybe you pick it up um, on vacation days or something like that. So there are a lot of different things to consider, and it's really important um, because people get emotional in this process. And if somebody offers you a base that's $5,000 more than somebody else's base, you really have to consider these other things too. Do they have a standard bonus that is 10% and 50% is mm -hmm. from your performance and 50% is the company's? You know, are they doing any match to 401ks? Um, are they doing a one or two for one match? That makes a big difference yeah. over a period of time. Um, not a lot of companies have pensions anymore, but some do. And um, vacation and sick days. I talked to someone this week who was good on the base that he was offered, but his vacation days were way different. He had had unlimited vacation at his last company, which can come with its own, uh, we were talking about this before it started, mm -hmm. it sounds really great, but in some companies, the culture does not allow you to really take advantage of those unlimited days because you're judged if you, you know, if the culture right. is you don't take time off, well, then it doesn't help you to have unlimited days. Also, when you leave, um, in a more normal situation, you could be paid for vacation time that you had not taken. In unlimited, you're not paid because how would you ever, you know, figure that out? So look at the vacation days. Look at sick days. Are they combined? Are they separate? Um, to really know what you are up against. If you only have three sick days um, and you have to take the others out of vacation days, like don't get sick for very long. Um, so some have benefits, some have pay for your car and sales roles. So there are all kinds of different things to consider and you should look at the whole picture. Um, and, you know, going forward with that, um, you know, title, Sometimes maybe you don't get the base you want, or maybe you get a, a lower amount, that compromise piece, mm -hmm. but they might give you a better title. You know, I've known companies that, that um, I've done searches for that did director positions that had nobody reporting to them, but they left with the director title, and that was important to and them. And so considering what matters most to you, yeah, we do come tend to come into this with emotions as well, but... When it comes down to it, what is your make or break? What is the most important thing to you with considering all of these um, with your you know, base compensation and all the different factors in play? Right. And you can negotiate in some cases, you know, saying, okay, you know, I'll come in at this base, but instead of an annual performance review or a six month performance review, could we do it in three months? You can assess my performance then and we, you know, can we can talk again. So you're only gonna know if any of these things are true if you ask. Okay, so here is the compensation spreadsheet. So just with the things that I talked about, but it really helps you make a comparison. And maybe that first company in the, in the chart is your current company. And then if you're looking at others, because it never hurts to look, um, to see what other companies are doing. And then you can have a fair assessment. You know, sometimes flex time is a key component 
because of where your life is at that moment. So, you know, judge this by where you are um, at any given time. So also pick your best person to negotiate with. In a hiring process, it could be the HR person, it could be the hiring manager. In, you know, in your current situation, um, probably it's always gonna be your boss. Yeah. You know, there's probably not a lot of options in there. Um, if you're in the hiring um, process, negotiate before a written offer. So you don't want to ask the question on compensation in the first interview. It's too soon. Um, and that, when I was a recruiter, I always asked people in the first conversation. So it, it's a, you know, it's a tug, it's a dance of um, when you give up that information. Mm -hmm. But I would want to know, if I was looking for somebody who was being paid $100,000 base, and I was talking to somebody who was currently making $150,000 base, I mean, they were not going to be interested in my position, and I didn't want to waste their time. Right. So, um, but asking, negotiating at the right time. They, the best time is when they love you, you know? <laughs> and you kind of love them, and that is the best time to negotiate. But if you can negotiate before, a, uh, um, before an offer, um, you're in better shape because generally if they're going to give you a verbal offer, you know, then maybe you do it right then. But if they give you a written offer, um, if you don't accept it and you want to negotiate, still doable, but they have to eat a little crow of going back and saying, um, you know, they didn't accept, you know, can we go up on this? And, you know, it's just an uncomfortable situation on both sides. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to burn, you know, any bridges because of that. So early you really, on. Yeah. yeah, you really have to kind of watch the process and know when you should uh, do it. And going back to that emotional piece of the whole thing, sometimes offers are accepted very quickly and then you hang up and you go, darn it, <laughs> darn it. Um, so ask for some time to think about it. There's Every, nothing wrong with yeah. asking. It, it's better than jumping the gun and, and just saying yes to whatever they ask you without even really taking a moment to think about it. Because you also want to consider and maybe ask more questions, clarifying questions of what all that entails too. Because they could just say, you know, 82,000 a year, but that's just, that's it. And so you want to clarify more of what is in the offer as well. Right. You just need time to think. And somebody who needs you to, a company that needs you to say yes or no right there, um, you know, I think you can ask, um, why do I have to make the decision right, right now? now? Can I have three days? Can I have the weekend? Can I have five days? Mm -hmm. um, that is reasonable. Asking to you to accept it right on the spot I think is is unreasonable and I think you should certainly negotiate that mm -hmm. absolutely so um, you know again on that compromise situation asking for more than what you think you'll get so don't be crazy um, because then you could go into that 17 <laughs> percent <laughs> rescinding the offer piece um, but you know go higher well, I think what comes into play here is with you doing your research on the different comparisons, like you were showing the comparison with Indeed and LinkedIn and Glassdoor, you see a variation there. So you kind of know where your high and low is, and you got to find what best fits for you. Um, and then it allows you some wiggle room that if they're not okay with that high end um, ask then you can have a place to negotiate. Right. Um, because you also have to consider where you're at right now. Mm -hmm. Right? If you're at 50 and you want to go to 75, it's a pretty big jump. Right. So, and probably they will have asked you along the way what your current compensation is. So, but if they make a lowball offer that offends you to your soul, <laughs> um, be cool, um, you know, be gracious. That never hurts. Recruiters 
change jobs like crazy. So you may run into this person, mm-hmm. you know, two months down the road at another company. So be respectful, thank them for the, their time. Um, ask them for the rationale behind it, because maybe there was a miscommunication somewhere in that they thought you were at a different base compensation or total compensation than what you what you really are. Um, but if you're cool about it, um, give them you know the proper information in a very nice way. They could come back and say, "I'm so sorry, we misunderstood, and now your offer is, right. is thus and so." And you definitely don't want to. I would recommend not taking a low, low ball offer. Um, you may like the company, but once you get in, you're going to find yourself beating yourself up because you aren't happy with your compensation. That's going to affect your performance, your morale, um, which affects everyone around you. And then your performance reviews are not going to be good. And you could be looking at your 90 day review and, having to find another job. Right. And that, you know, a low base, all of those things, Mm -hmm. plus every single thing, um, raises, bonuses, promotions, everything that follows in that company and the company after will be based somehow on that base. So I have seen this be a spiral for people in that they're like, oh, I need to get out of here. I need another job. This isn't the right amount of money, but maybe I can move it up. And then they go in and all those things are affected, you know, and then they have to get out of there. And it's just, it's hard to recover. It's it's hard to recover. Uh, You know, I've been in that, that incredibly low base early in my career. And I realized that if you multiplied my base compensation by any number, it was bad. It was still bad. (laughs) (laughs) And that, you know, it, so I left and I went into a different career and, you know, it had a very happy ending, but think about those multipliers. Mm -hmm. Um, So you're going to be asked compensation questions in a hiring process. Clearly, if you're in a company, they know what you make, but they might want to know what your current compensation is um, or salary history. Um, In an extreme case, W-2s, that was generally in sales positions. And I think I saw that happen one time in 15 years. And I told the employer, that's a gross. Don't do that. So asking what your anticipated compensation for the role is. And I have asked that question thousands of times. And usually people say to me as a recruiter, as much as I can get, <laughs> not helpful. Um, and, and don't, don't low ball yourself as right. well, because you're afraid they may say, Oh, well, we can't do that. Don't, don't put yourself in that position to take the low, low end as well. Right. So the longer you can delay that conversation, the better. And, um, because I can guarantee you whatever number you tell them they have written down. You know, <laughs> if they don't write down anything else that you've said, <clears throat> they're writing that number down. So um, try and avoid the compensation um, answer on the first call. And, you know, these are some, some things that you can say. You know, at some point you're going to have to tell them. But before you get a call, I mean, think about how you would tell that that compensation um, story. Um, These are some good suggestions as well. Yeah, because they're all nice, Mm -hmm. you know, and you always want to be nice. Well, you know, you don't want to be the opposite of nice (laughs) because (laughs) they won't fall in love with you. (laughs) So you can get as complicated as you want. Um, and there's some, you know, probably good reasons to think this through and figure out um, knowing your numbers, um, knowing what you're up for, you know, on raises, um, you know, these are 5% and 10% and 5% and 10% absolutely happen. They just don't happen everywhere. Mm-hmm. But being able to do the math and to be able to kind of justify what that number you're going to give them is. Mm -hmm. so 
you want to be a good negotiating partner. Um, you want the, the company or your boss to be a good negotiating partner. So, you know, acting from being informed and prepared and not out of emotion and, you know, being good to the people that you're negotiating with. Um, and if all those things happen, because it can get tense at this compensation yeah. part. And I used to negotiate um, with my candidates um, most of the time because I kept my, my clients, my employers out of the mix so that when that candidate started, everything was good between them. And if there was any angst, it was between me and the um, employer and the candidate. But that doesn't always happen. More times than not, you're negotiating your, your own situation. So here we are, ready for questions. Thank you, Sue. Okay, so let's take some questions. And again, we'll get to as many as we can. How can I tactfully ask how my salary compares with a man who has similar qualifications and experience? I want to know that I'm being compensated fairly, given that the pay gap is still so institutionalized. Um, gosh, there's no, there's no set answer for that. Um, I found out that two men I was working with early in my career um, were making twice as much as I did. Um, but like that happened over a lunch conversation. So sometimes it comes out. Mm -hmm. It's, you can ask the person, but you better have a pretty decent uh, uh, relationship with them and they'd be very reluctant um, to tell. Mm -hmm. You can go to HR and ask what the compensation range is for the position. And, but just asking it in a way of, I'm trying to understand where I am in the position. Could you share with me um, could you share with me, can you help me understand, are two ways to start a question, question. that's difficult to, to ask? Again, it's being your own advocate um, and asking. You don't know what you don't know, and if you're not willing to, to step out and ask, there's going to be no room for change. And, and the glass door that we talked about, yeah. at least you might, if you're in a large enough organization, you might be able to see what that range is. And if you're at the bottom of it, um, the only way is up. Absolutely. All right, next question. Um, how do you research salary when your job has a large range? And also, how do you find data that differentiates between small, medium, and large companies? Um, you know, again, you can use um, Glassdoor on this. Mm -hmm. You can think about companies, I mean, again, small companies really aren't going to have much in there probably, but you can think about, okay, what are some medium-sized companies in my industry and look at what their ranges are. What are large companies in my industry and just kind of do it that way. You know, none of this stuff is, is like 100% perfect, no. um, but it's certainly better than it used to be as far as how you could ever research this. I mean, there was, you know, just a couple of decades ago, there was no information like this really available. You took what you got. <laughs> right. And you were darn happy. <laughs> yes. <it> too. <laughs> um, so does the 10 to 20% increase to leave a company apply to engineers? I, I think so. You know, I think it depends on, you know, are you in a small, medium, large company? Mm -hmm. Are you underpaid, overpaid, but I think that increase, um, so it says, so a 20 uh, claims to be constant peer review, um, you know, maybe they are, but I've seen a lot of companies who did those compensation reviews mm -hmm. that I was never that thrilled with <laughs> what they came up with. Um, but again, looking, yeah. um, looking on there. So 20% could, you know, what are your skills, um, you know, are the things that you know how to do and have experience with really hot in the market? Um, have you been at a company for a while and had like lower increases? It's all so totally um, individual. Uh, what about salary increases in your present role? I knew the range for my position was 75 to 95K, but accepted 70K given that I didn't meet the requirements time-wise. But how do I now? How do I 
ask for a midpoint now. I got a good perform performance review, but we only get around 3%. Um, wow, well, you know, it's, you're at the, I mean, you're not at the low end of the range. You're lower than the low end of the mm -hmm. range. So I think certainly going in and being able, part of your case is, is right in the question in that, um, you didn't meet the time requirements, the three to five years mm -hmm. or whatever, and now you do, I think being able to go in and say, you know, I've been here, I now have whatever it is, five years of experience, and and I've done these things, again, looking at your performance and having your accomplishments. Um, I understand that the range is 75 to 95, and I think I've, I've with time and everything else, achieved more than to be at the low end of the range. And if you're already approaching, say, two, three years, you may want to evaluate and consider, is it time to move on? And at that point, you may get that additional 10 to 20% increase by moving on to another company. Yeah, that 3% multiplier, um, I'm very familiar with, but uh, <laughs> it's, very common. Uh, yeah. It's not a great multiplier. Yeah. And it's never going to be a great multiplier. This is a good one. Most companies give vacation time based on tenure with a company. When moving to a new company, how can I negotiate more time off given my overall work experience? I think you have to ask. Um, and that, you know, again, your justification is in the is in the the meat of the question. Mm -hmm. um, I had uh, you have two weeks of vacation for new employees of my previous role. I've been there X number of years, and I have three weeks or or whatever it is. So, um, yeah. And it's not unlikely. Some of my clients um, have had uh, new employees come in and ask and negotiate more time off, and the company creates a new policy, a new vacation PTO policy specifically for that person. It's in their offer letter as well. Um, if it's a verbal, I highly recommend that you ask for it to be noted in your offer letter um, in case that manager ends up leaving. Uh, you want to make sure that you, you know, are still getting what you were offered originally. Um, but it's completely plausible that you could get an additional time, um, time off, but you have to ask for it. Well, and that you know, just a little add on to that. There are many additional vacation days negotiated that are negotiated under the table. Mm -hmm. It's kind of one of those wink, wink. Um, I can't officially give you another week off, but I can, um, but just know that I, we won't mark it the way it is. Right. But again, if that, you should then follow up with how long are you planning to stay at the company? <laughs> because true. if they leave, sometimes your vacation goes right out the door. Yeah. Um, I think we have time for just a couple more questions. Um, so, let's see here. When is a good time to ask about offering of base pay and compensation package, uh, 401k match, vacation days, et cetera? Should you ask about these items prior to the face-to-face -face interview, at the interview, at the offering, or at some other time? I would say it's right between the interview and the offering. Like when you start to know that it's looking pretty serious, Promising. Um, I think talking to the HR person, if you're dealing with one, or the, the recruiter, recruiter, right, um, to be able to say, you know, I'm, I'm super excited about this and it, you know, it looks like everything's going well. Um, you know, would you be willing to share um, what your general benefits package is? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times they go, fine, and they just, email a PDF over and you've got it to look at it. Mm -hmm. But if not, then certainly um, at the offer and before you decide. Yeah. Uh, let's do one more question. Do you ever decline to share or inflate current comp? I feel like my qualifications and ability to sell myself should dictate my asking range, not what I'm making now. Um, hold on, I have to think about that question. Um, you know, you have to be careful about inflating it. I think maybe you have to, you can decline to share, but at some point, depending on who you're talking to, it can be 
you know, the standoff of, well, you can't go forward if you don't tell me, you know, so you can kind of butt heads on that. But I would think if you're going to tell your current comp, it's like we looked at on that slide that said, you know, I have this and I get this and I get that. And so total, what I want is this. Um, and then you just say it really fast. Yeah. <laughs> but you say what I want is this really slow. <laughs> yeah. So um, thank you for all the questions. We uh, There's a lot of really great ones. And we can't get to all of your questions, but we will answer them and send out an FAQ sheet uh, with answers and the recording. Um, we'd like to thank you again for attending this session of our Career Edge series. We will be sending out a follow-up survey for your feedback, along with some resources from our presentation today. Um, a reminder for those who have not registered for, um, yes, for our uh, upcoming session in March, um, you can register at the bit.ly backslash career edge two. Um, in March, we will host our last session focused on building an effective relationship with your boss. So that you can ask them for a raise. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and if you would like more information about our other alumni events and ways to get involved with the Business School Alumni Network, please visit us at business.ucdenver.edu backslash alumni. Thank you.